1 Chronicles chapter 17. Now before I, I get to reading this, I, I was considering the fact that there are a handful of things we parents know that our kids don't yet understand. I know it's shocking, especially to teenagers, to realize, you know, John, that mom and dad actually know a few things that you haven't yet figured out. <laughs> as dumb as mom and dad sometimes seem, not talking about Gary and Leslie. <laughs> But parents do know a few things that that kids need to learn. And one of the most important words that a parent has to learn to speak is the word no. No, you may not shave your head and paint it pink. No, you may not drive with your high school friends up to Canada this Friday night. I don't care if it is for class credit and multicultural studies. No, you may not quit school and start your own tattoo parlor. No. I had to tell my daughter, not Hannah, but Anna Marie. And I know I said I wouldn't be telling stories on them, but I just can't help it. Last week she said, Dad, I'm going to bed at 5 o'clock tonight. It's the first time in my life as a parent I said, no, you may not go to bed early. You may go to bed at 8 o'clock at the earliest. But I want to go to bed at 5. I have no idea. Why? She wanted to go to bed at 5 o'clock? She just did? No, you may not. No is one of the hardest words to say. There are three answers that's been said to any given prayer. Three answers. Yes, not yet, and no. And when you're seeking something and looking for it, it does not work out the, the way you wanted it to. Well, that's tough. Well, this morning we're going to look at one of those situations where no is the answer. In fact, it's one of the most significant no's in all of Scripture. It comes in answer to David's desire to do something special for his dad, and his father says, no, you may not. But the result is arguably one of the greatest prophetic covenants in all of Scripture. Had God not said no to David, we would have lost this great covenant. Especially when it comes to prophecies of the Messiah, this is the hinge point. This is the key. Following a great no, the Lord will make a unilateral, unconditional, irrevocable covenant with David and with Israel, which becomes the premise and the promise on which all of biblical prophecy rests. It's called the Davidic Covenant. It's just a fancy way of saying covenant with David. It's been said that it's difficult, if not impossible, even to understand the prophets from this point forward without the context of the Davidic covenant, found first in 2 Samuel chapter 7, but repeated here in 1 Chronicles 17. I don't know if you realize this, but we're, we're getting close to blasting off biblically. We've been laying foundation since the bridge began. The Lord has been laying foundation. And that's what the Bible does. Beginning in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah. Foundation of Jewish law and history. And then on in from there, we continue to see that foundation, those bricks, if you will, being laid for us. We get all the way through 1 Chronicles. We're going to hit Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and we'll be into the wisdom literature. Just on the other side of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, we hit... Isaiah and the prophets. When we hit the prophets, buckle up. Because we will be flying. We will be in an amazing and exciting place. And at the end of the prophets, then, boom, we're into the New Testament. So for those of you who think it's been taking a long time getting through Scripture, trust me, we're only, we're like within 20 years of finishing the whole thing. (laughs) But I point that out to say this. At this point... This covenant is given. And if you understand the covenant, when we get to the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, on down the line, you will understand. And it will make great sense. And the prophets will come alive to you. If you don't get this covenant, the prophets are long and tedious and confusing and difficult to follow. This is an important one. J. Vernon McGee put it this way. He said, one of the reasons many people find themselves so hopelessly confused in the study of biblical prophecy is because they do not pay attention to the Davidic covenant. This is by far the most significant chapter thus far in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17. And it all grows out of a single answer to David's plans, which is 
No. No. Let's read it. Chapter 17, verse 1. It came about when David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I'm dwelling in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under curtains. And then Nathan, he said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. David, at this point, gang, he's at the top of his game. He has won in the battle against Saul. He has lasted. Saul has met his demise. Israel has gathered around David with a perfect heart, the Bible tells us. Unified around this man. There was no division. All of Israel said, David, he's our king. He's the one. Back back in 1 Chronicles 14, verse 1, it says, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees, masons, and carpenters to build a house for him, a gift from one king to another. And David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people, Israel. David gets it. Wow, it has all come to pass. Everything God promised me has happened now. And I am at rest, and I am in my house of cedar, which meant he had no moth problems. I'm in a good place here. And I'm resting, and Israel's behind me, and I've got my kingdom established. We've got some Philistine problems, but you know what? The strength of Israel was great at that time. It would only continue to climb under David and then under his son Solomon. This one-time exile from the caves is now singing Viva la Vida. For the first time, he is in the lap of luxury. Josephus tells us this about David. When he settled in his kingdom, this man, his wealth, was roughly the equivalent of a billion dollars. That's how much was amassed to David, was given to David. But as David considers this great position, you can almost see him flinching. As he looks around his home, perhaps you've done that. Perhaps the Lord has blessed you in numerous ways, and you look around at your blessings and you just kind of flinch. Man, why do I get all of this? And there are so many in the world who don't have. Why do I get all of this? Well, David was doing that, but he wasn't looking out of the world. He was looking at the Lord. Why do I get this? And the ark is in a tent. God's ark of the covenant is in a teepee out there. And I'm in a cedar house. This, this just doesn't seem right. He's hanging out with his prophet friend, Nathan. We know they were good friends because David named one of his sons after Nathan. In fact, the line of David will run through his son Nathan and all the way down to Mary, just as much as the line of David ran through Solomon, all the way down through to Joseph. And so he's hanging out with Nathan the prophet, and Nathan says, right on, Dave, your heart is in the right place. I hear what you're saying. David hadn't overtly said, I want to build a temple for the Lord, but he says, hey, I'm in a house, and the Lord's in the tent there, and... Man, I'm struggling with this. And Nathan says, go for it, man. I know what you're thinking. You go, David. God's on your side. Do what your heart is telling you. Now, when Nathan says that, do all that is in your heart, verse 2, for God is with you. He's not giving that loosey-goosey, empty-headed phrase of today that I get so tired of hearing, follow your heart. (laughs) What if you have heart problems? (laughs) You know? What if your heart leads you right down the wrong path? The heart, as the Bible tells us, is the most deceitful of all things. Desperately sick. Not my words, God's words. I encourage you, don't follow your heart. Unless the Holy Spirit has taken charge of your heart. But even then, you're not following your heart. You're following the Lord. But he says, God is with you. He knew David's heart was right before the Lord. And the Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. But that, that uh, process there is important to understand. Delight yourself first in the Lord, and He will give Not go for the desires of your heart. And if you get them, you can delight in the Lord. If you delight yourself in the Lord, guess what? The desires of your heart are going to be after the desires of the Father. If you're delighted with Him. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, the the psalmist writes, and He will do it. So Nathan tells David, sounds good. I know you're a man of God, man after God's own heart. I know where your heart is, David. Go for it. Your heart's right. God's with you. Well, that night, the Lord grabs hold of Nathan and says, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. It came about the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant. Thus says the Lord, you shall not build a house for me to dwell in. No. What? But God, all I want to do is this great thing for you. No, David. 
No. Verse 5, he says, I have not dwelt in a house since the day I was brought up. I brought up Israel to this place. I have gone from tent to tent and from one dwelling place to another. In all the places where I have walked with all Israel, have I spoken a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built for me a house of cedar? God says, I, I've never had a house of cedar. I've never asked for a house of cedar. Well, what's the deal? Does God prefer camping over settling? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. God would rather camp than settle. You Bible students may recall how God told the children of Israel to prepare to leave for Egypt. Let me read this to you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. About the first Passover, God said, You shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Back when we studied Exodus, we talked about the picture there. Your loins girded, kind of a biblical sounding religious sounding phrase, it just means you're wearing your shorts, you know. <laughs> Take your robe and, and pull them up higher so you can move quickly. And that's what they did. If they had to run, they grew up their loins. He's so like, get ready to go. You got your shorts on, your sandals, so he's got, got their tevas, walking stick. In another place, it said they took their kneading bowls and they put them on their backs. So they got their backpack. These guys are ready to travel. They're ready to hike. And that's the picture God begins them with. And you may know the first place they stopped on their journey. And I believe it's significant. In fact, every place in the first few that they stopped on their journey once they led Egypt, left Egypt is significant. first place is called Sukkot, tent town. The Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot today in Israel, they build tents out of palm fronts. And it's, it's a whole focus. God made a whole entire feast around the idea of not being too settled, of being ready to go at a moment's notice. He pulls them out of Egypt, which itself is a biblical picture of the world. He puts their feet on a journey to the land of promise, which is a biblical picture of our life. We are on a journey, gang. We are sojourners. In fact, Eric and Maureen have for a long time had an email address that I just love, and it's sojourner. Sojourners. That's that's what we are. Don't get too settled. Just like the Lord who said, I didn't ask for a house of cedar. I went from tent to tent, from one dwelling place to another. I'm mobile, man. I'm moving around because this is not your home. This is short term. You're camping out until Jesus comes. And I love that about the Lord. He preferred a tent because His people were just a passing through. In fact, we're told in John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But the Word dwelt there is literally tabernacled. Jesus came and pitched His tent among us. Why didn't He build a house? Because He wasn't going to be here long. And the same principle applies to us. Don't settle, my friends. We are sojourners. We are short timers on this planet. So was Nathan the prophet wrong? Listen again to what Nathan said back in verse 2. Do all that is in your heart for God is with you. And that night God had to show up and say, no, I'm not. The answer is no. I do not want David to build me a house. Nathan gave David the green light. Nathan the prophet. Say, go, David. When he should have put on the red light. Stop. Nope. This is not God's will. Nathan missed this one. Nathan was wrong. Prophets can be wrong from time to time. It's wise for us as believers to be aware of that. Some might say, well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere that a prophet who makes an erroneous statement is a false prophet? You're not to listen to anything he says? And we've got to deal with that with Nathan here. Is Nathan now suddenly a false prophet because he misdirects David? Not so. But going back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, it says, The prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Here's the test. Deuteronomy 18, 22, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord... If the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. And that prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So how do we square this with Nathan's false prophecy? And the answer is simple. Nathan was not prophesying. There's no thus says the Lord here. He doesn't come and say, the Lord says, da 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 
He just says, David, I know your heart's right. Go for it. I'm sure God's with you. He's not speaking as a prophet. He's speaking as a friend. And as a friend, he missed it. As a friend, Nathan got it wrong. But he never gave that, thus saith the Lord. He wasn't speaking in God's name. He was speaking in Nathan's name. He was just speaking for himself. He knew the Lord was with David. And so he assumed the desire of David's heart was right. Listen, gang, just because someone happens to be a prophet or a pastor or a church leader doesn't mean whatever they speak is God's truth. Present company, you know, excluded. (laughs) Paul was often very careful to write, I say, not the Lord, but I say to you, and then he would say something. And any time you see Paul saying that, he's giving his opinion. I say... (laughs) You know, it's better for people just to remain single and celibate. Boy, I'm so thankful that Paul said, I say, and not the Lord on that one. I would have had a little trouble with that. As far as following Christian leaders is concerned, let me give you a couple of great pieces of wisdom here. Whether it be, again, a pastor, a prophet, a church leader. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says the following. He says, be imitators of me. Just as also I am of Christ. And that's the key. In essence, follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me as you see me imitating Jesus, following after Jesus. If your leaders are following Christ, man, follow along. If they are not following Christ, you're released. Don't follow. Now Hebrews chapter 11 verse 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as to those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. (laughs) And I like the way he writes that. It's a good word. But it doesn't imply blind allegiance to church leaders. You are not to blindly just follow after as people across history have done, tragically. Well, my pastor said, this is where we're going. Well, he said, this. so we all drank the fruit punch. Because that's what he said to do. And he's a man of God. He can't be wrong, can he? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. 1 Thessalonians 5.20, Paul also said, Don't despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. And hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And by the way, I need to say to those of you who believe you have a prophetic gifting, you need to be sure that your thus saith the Lord was truly saith by the Lord. Don't go around saying, Hey, God has a word for you. Unless you're pretty sure God has a word for that person. And if someone comes to you and says, God has a word for you, then you say to them, thank you so much. I'm going to pray about that and see if the Lord confirms that it's from Him. We put an awful lot of weight sometimes on the thus saith the Lord. So the Lord immediately speaks to Nathan. Since you got ahead of me on this one, Nathan, I need you to go tell David. I think that's interesting. He goes to the source. The Lord doesn't go to David and say, no, Nathan was wrong. Let's talk about this. He goes to Nathan, who was wrong, and says, get it straightened out and go talk to David. There's something good in that for us relationship-wise. If you get something, someone, there's a wrong thing, don't go over here to the other person. You go directly to the source first and let it get straightened out there. Now, stop for a moment and think. When you're all charged up and excited about doing something, how does the word no make you feel? Hey, let's do this great thing. I got a wonderful idea. And people around go, no, no. I mean, I felt it. I felt it in elders meetings where I came in, sat down and said, hey, I got a great idea. Lay it all out. And the guys go, I don't know if I like that. It doesn't resonate with me so much. Come on. What do you mean no? It's always disappointing. But watch this. God is about to reveal something David could not even possibly have imagined. Verse 7. Now, therefore, God is still speaking. Thus, you shall say to my servant, David, thus says the Lord of hosts. God always does that when he's about to speak. Let it be clear. This is from God. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be leader over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a name all like the name of the great ones who are in the earth. Did he do that, by the way? Is the name of David not worldwide known as one of the great ones? I'll give you that name, he says. I will appoint, verse 9, a place for my people, Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and not be moved again. 
and the wicked will not waste them any more as formerly. Verse 10, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I tell you, love this, that the Lord will build a house for you. When your days are fulfilled that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be one of your sons. I will establish his kingdom. He will build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. And that's not talking about Solomon. I will be his father, and he shall be my son, and I will not take my loving kindness away from him, as I took it from him who was before you, speaking of Saul. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. And according to all these words, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. This time Nathan comes to David and says, Thus saith the Lord. And this is huge. This is incredible. It's not a palace, David. It's a person. I'm going to build for you a house. But it's not a mansion. It's Messiah. The house that God built for David would not be built of beams or stones, but an eternal promise built on the foundation of one man, Jesus Christ, the son of David. And this, as I said to you before, this is the hinge point of all biblical prophecy from this point on. And it's absolutely breathtaking, but it's still a no. What David had in his heart, what he was charged up and excited to do, was to build a temple for the Lord. Ultimately, David would even be the one who designs all the archaeological plans and amasses all the the, the stuff to go into the temple. All the materials. All the financing. But he won't build it. David was so excited to do this. And God said, No. No. I'm doing something more amazing for you and through you, but you will not be the one to build me a house. How do you handle it when God says no? What do you do when you pray and pray and pray and God says no? Maybe you had a desire at some point in your life to enter into the mission field. And God said no. God, I want to do this for you. No. No, that's not the direction. I remember Paul, Silas, and Timothy were on their missionary journeys, working together, and there were numerous mission detours. Paul wanted to go one place, and God would say no. Acts chapter 16, verse 6, says they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Well, that's weird. God, don't you want the word to go everywhere, including Asia? Yes, but it's not going to be through you, Paul. And Silas, not now. No, I forbid you to speak there. After they came to Mysia, it says, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. No. But but Lord, we want to go on this mission for you. No. Maybe you prayed for that one relationship in your life that seemed to be the perfect fit. Her name was Julie. I wrote a song for her. Julie, you're the girl of my dreams. God said no. I was in seventh grade. It was a hard year. (laughs) But maybe more seriously, you've been in a place as a young adult where you've sought a certain relationship and that person was right. You you both loved the Lord and you felt like this is the one. This is going to happen. And it didn't. And God said no. No. In the midst of this grand Davidic covenant, there's a great lesson for us all. If we, if we look at David and how he responds to the N.O. of the Father. He could have been disappointed. Man, all I wanted to do was something nice for you, Lord. And you're saying no? He could have argued the point. Okay, well, eternal stuff is all well and good. But i got big plans now. Covenant schmovenant. I'd like to do something now. He could have pestered. I'm sure... None of your children have ever pestered you. Come on, Father, please, 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 please. Let me build you a house. My son Hayden is king of the pesters. The little pest. I love him to death, but man, Dad, oh, come on, Dad, please. He just does not take no for an answer. Well, you know what? A lot of us don't take no for an answer from the Lord ourselves. 
He says no, and we're just, I'm sorry. No. You say no, I'm saying no to your no. Because this is what I want to do, and I know where I'm headed, and I know what's best. And you know what happens when we respond to God that way? We blow the nose. We blow the nose. We mess up the no of God. Listen. For every prayer that is answered, yes, not yet, or no, every answer is perfect. And every single answer that God gives us has with it opportunity, even the no answer. In fact, often the no answer has the greater opportunity if we will take time to be in the no. And for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about that. All puns aside, to be in the no of God. When God says no to you, to rest there, to be there, to stay there. And recognize what it is about God saying no that is so significant to me right now. Watch how David responds. I'm going to give you three things to jot down if you'd like to. Verse 16. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord. I just love that picture. He doesn't plop down and start throwing a tantrum. He goes in and sits down before the Lord. And he said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? This was a small thing in your eyes, O God, but you have spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come and have regarded me according to the standard of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What more can David still say to you concerning the honor bestowed on your servant? For you know your servant. Check that out. David says, for you know your servant. You know me. How in the world could you do this for me when you know me? You know who I am. Verse 19, O Lord, for your servant's sake. And according to your own heart, you have wrought all this greatness to make known all these great things. First thing to do when God says no, put things into godly perspective. Put things into godly perspective. That is, attempt to see things from God's viewpoint. Let go of yours long enough to say, okay, what does the Lord see that I don't see? What is His perspective? Now you might say, well, how do I do that? I'm not omnipotent. You know, how am I supposed to know the mind of God? Well, look at what David did. He went in and sat before the Lord. Rather than argue or fight back, he sat down. And he began to pray. He got quiet and still. And in that place, David began to understand God's perspective. Psalm 46.10, one of the great verses of Scripture. Cease striving and know that I am God. You think you got your plans all worked out. You think you know the direction of your life and where it needs to go and what you need to do to prepare to get there. Cease striving. And know that I am God. And the first three words out of David's mouth in verse 16 are, Who am I? Who am I? He made a similar statement in Psalm 8. He said, What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man that you care for him. In God's perspective, listen gang, you know that God doesn't have to do a blessed thing for you. You realize that God doesn't owe you anything? The fact that you took your first breath of life, your first step, you had your first bite of food, that was all blessing. That was not earned. And the older we get and the longer we live, the less we earn the good things of God and the more we realize it's just grace. He doesn't owe me a thing. And that is a godly perspective to understand. David says, who am I? His whole first response as he talks to the Lord is, I mean, he has completely now let go of the fact that God said no. And he's saying, I cannot believe you would do this for me. Your servant. He is humbled by this precious offering. This gift of God. James 1.17 tells us every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Verse 18 says, In the exercise of His will, He brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. So get quiet, be still, cease striving, shut up, and put things into godly perspective when God says no. By the way, because David did this, 
Because he went in and sat before the Lord, two things happened in his heart. David, first of all, was enlightened. He was enlightened. He saw things he would not have known otherwise. The Lord revealed things to him that would have been unknown. First Chronicles 22, verse 6. If you skip ahead, look at this. This is David pulling Solomon in and charging him with the task to build the temple. Listen to what David has learned in the meantime because he accepted the word of God, because he got a godly perspective. First Chronicles 22, 6. He called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. David said to Solomon, My son... I had intended to build a house in the name of the Lord my God, but the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You have shed much blood and have waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you've shed so much blood on the earth before me. Wasn't he led by God to shed that blood? Yes. But nonetheless, David was a man of war with blood on his hands. Behold, a son will be born to you. This is David talking about what he learned from God. A son will be born to you who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from his enemies on every side. For his name shall be Solomon. Shlomo. Shlomo. His name means peace. Shalom. That's where Solomon's name comes from. I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. He shall build a house in my name. For he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Here's why, David says, I couldn't build a house. I was a man of war. He's not thinking about that. When he wants to build the temple, he's thinking, I got this great idea, these plans for God. And God says no, and David gets quiet and learns why. He's enlightened in this truth that God's house has to be built in peace. By his son, Shalom. Solomon, peaceful one. David got that because he sat quietly before the Lord. Not only was he enlightened, but because he sat quietly, because he got that godly perspective, David was also encouraged. If you go over to Second Chronicles, or I'll, I'll just do this quickly. You can jump over there if you'd like to. Second Chronicles, chapter six, in verse eight. Solomon is now speaking and he's referring back to David and he says the Lord said to my father's to my father David because it was in your heart to build a house for my name you did well that it was in your heart it's cool that it was in your heart David David learned this not only was he enlightened he was encouraged Because one of the things that God told David as David sat quietly gaining God's perspective was, this was a good idea. You did well, son. I'm proud of you. God literally honored David's desire in his heart. He didn't let him build the temple, but he told David the idea is great. You did well. Well done, son. Who among us doesn't love to or long to hear that from a father? Well done. Well done. David sat and got things in a godly perspective. He was enlightened. He was encouraged. He received that word of encouragement. You did good, Dave. And all that because he put the no into perspective. Second thing to do when the Lord says no, not only put things in a godly perspective, but praise the Lord for the no. Praise the Lord for the no. Don't just accept the no, but praise Him for it. Look at verse 20, 1 Chronicles 17. O oh Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And, and what one nation in all the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make you a name by great and terrible things, and driving out nations from before your people, whom you redeemed out of Egypt. For your people Israel... You made your own people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. David just launches into praise. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is wonderful. When was the last time you thanked the Lord for things not going your way? When was the last time you sat down and said, Boy, my Ira took a tank with this economy. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I'm on the verge of losing my house. Praise the Lord. I know it sounds a little crazy. And if you do it out in the world, in the workplace, if you say, boy, you know what? My car got taken away the other day. Hallelujah. I know what people are going to say. They're going to look at you and go, we need to call someone with a white coat and have you picked up, buddy. That's strange thinking. 
My plans are all shot down. I'm not doing what I set out to do because God said no. Praise God. Praise God. Job did. You remember the story. He loses everything. And what does he respond? Job 1.21, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And that includes when the answer is no. That includes when I'm not getting what I think I should get or what I want to get. Praise the Lord continually. Praise the Lord anyway. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not getting my way. I know how that sounds, again, from a worldly perspective, a little strange. But my friends, to praise God in the no is incredibly liberating. It is a liberating exercise in faith, and not only for you, but for other people as well. Do you know how much it speaks of the glory of God when you have a bad turn of events in your life and you're praising the Lord anyway? People see that, and they may be confused by it, but they're going to look at it and say, Man, there's something different. He's lost everything. She's lost all she hoped for, but she's still worshiping God. It's things like that that make people want to check out this Jesus who can bring joy even in the no. Psalm 119.74 says, May those who fear you see me and be glad because I wait for your word. And people are watching. Praise God in the no. Put things into a godly perspective. And number three... Pray for the no. Pray for the no. What do you mean by that? Look at verse 23. Now, O Lord, let the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house be established forever and do as you have spoken. Let your name be established and magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel. And the house of David, your servant, is established before you. For you, oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build for him a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray before you. Now, O Lord, you are God and have promised this good thing to to your servant. And now it has pleased you to bless the house of your servants, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord, have blessed and it is blessed forever. Pray for the no. This is just great. Look at what David is doing here. He immediately begins praying for the outcome of the no. You're not going to let me do this. You're doing something else, and that's what I'm going to pray for. And I'm going to join you, Father, in saying, may it be done. May you establish my house forever. May you accomplish all that you want to accomplish. May you establish your people, Israel. He's praying alongside God. This promise is great, and he receives it, accepts it, and then begins to pray for it. Do you know the Bible lists over 3,000 promises of God? There is no lack or shortage of promises to pray for. Pick one, open your Bible, find one, and pray that God makes it so. You've heard me pray for Jesus' return many times. You know, you might think that's silly. He's going to come whether you pray for it or not, Rick. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, the Bible says. Well, God's going to bring peace to Jerusalem in His time, His way. Whether Rick prays for it or not, why are you doing this? Why pray for something God has already determined to do? It's called agreement with the Father. You come to the Father praying His will, praying His desire, praying, as Jesus says, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6.10. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, Can two walk together unless they are agreed? One of the greatest faith building exercises we can do is pray in agreement with the Father. He may have determined it. He may have ordained it. He may say, this is my plan. You grab hold of that plan and pray he brings it to pass. Because you are praying in agreement with the Father. Your faith is growing. You are aligning yourself to his ways and to his spirit. And that's the whole point of the Christian walk, isn't it? That we align ourselves with God. We come into agreement with the Spirit of the Lord. Our job, gang, and it is not faith, hear me this, it is not faith to pull God's will into mine. To usurp His will to make it like mine. No, God, I'm going to pray this again and again and again because this is my will. No, it's now that I understand your will, I'm praying your will. I am praying your will. Going back to that relationship example, young man and young woman are together, and though they both love the Lord, the Lord says no. And for the young man or the young woman at that point to begin saying, Lord, 
I pray that you will bless this other person's future relationship with the person you have for them. I pray your will for them. I pray your will for me. I don't know why these things are happening all around me, but praise the Lord, I pray your will through all of this. Through my financial downfall, I pray your will, Father. Be glorified however you need to. Through my loss, I praise you, Father. Whatever you need to do, your will be done. As I said before, every no from the Father is accompanied by a great opportunity. We have opportunity to gain God's perspective. To know and follow His will. We have opportunity to praise His purposes. And again, that's an incredible testimony of faith to a world that rebels against the no of the Father for us to receive and accept it joyfully in worship. We have opportunity to pray in God's promises, agreeing and aligning ourselves with the Father. Brothers and sisters, do you want to be like David, a man or a woman after God's own heart? What we've talked about this morning is one of the greatest ways to step in that direction. To receive God's will for your life, even the no's, and to align yourself with that. To learn what it really means to be in the no of your Father. David, as we've seen, was in absolute awe at what God was telling him. That God was going to build him an eternal house. Not a palace or mansion or even a temple, but a posterity. A line that would be eternal, that would never end. And even in that eternal line, a kingdom that would be perfect forever. David begins to realize Messiah is coming from him. Messiah means anointed one. David who was anointed three times. His son Solomon would be anointed. Each king down the line would be anointed. Ultimately the anointed one, not anointed by man, but the anointed one of God would come, Jesus Christ, in the line of David, to set up his kingdom. Where is his kingdom now, Rick? It's not here yet. He came first as the suffering servant. Anointed to save, he will come again to set up his kingdom. Revelation 22:16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things from, for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now listen, last thing. Here's how we're different than David. We don't have a posterity. Ours is not the posterity. Messiah is not coming down the line from us. We are his posterity. We are the posterity of the anointed one. We are of the line, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you've given yourself to him, you are of the line of Jesus. Drawn into that family, John 1.12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. We're on the other side. David looked down the line and said, wow, Messiah is going to come from me. Fantastic, an eternal home. We're on this side saying, I'm part of the household. I'm drawn into the family. I'm of the posterity of Jesus Christ. Praise God for the no. Father, you do know when it's right to say yes, when it's right to say not yet, when it's right to say no. May we be a people who learn how to accept the no when it's given. Not to receive it as children throwing temper tantrums, not to receive it out of frustration, not to plead or pester with you to change your mind, but to receive in faith the perfect will that you have for all of our lives, for this church, for your kingdom, Father. We pray you will teach us how to accept it when you say no. And we do praise you, Lord, for all your goodness, your mercy, and Father, who can fathom your mind. Give us the mind of Christ that we may accept yes, not yet, and no, in Jesus' name. Amen.